This is the first novel I've read from Gombrowicz, a Polish author who the New York Times described as a leftist anti-clerical bisexual whose writings use brutal wit and outrageous sexual commentary to ridicule authority and class distinctions. How can we lose? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm blah, 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 blah. this haircut has gone from uncooperative to downright mutinous. It must die. How's it going? Great to see you. Get that copy. Today is Pornografia by Vitold Gombrowicz. This was a gift from a friend and patron of the show, Jordan. Thanks a bunch, man. Really appreciate it. This is the first novel I've read from Gombrowicz, a Polish author who the New York Times described as a leftist anti-clerical bisexual whose writings use brutal wit and outrageous sexual commentary to ridicule authority and class distinctions. How can we lose? Gombrowicz was an influence on Julio Cortazar and uh, Roberto Bolaño, and also had the praises of Milan Kundera, who uh, is the Polish author who wrote uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which I have not read, but a very famous author nonetheless. Gombrowicz has one of the most interesting bios among 20th century authors. It's almost like a very dark joke as the forward by Sam Lipsight says in the book. It goes like this. A Polish man gets on a ship headed towards Argentina in 1939 to go and visit for two weeks. While he's away, news gets to him of Stalin and Hitler signing the non-aggression pact, and Poland is invaded. This is all in the period of 15 days, two weeks while he's just going to check out Argentina. So he decides not to go back. He survives with the money he brought on his trip, which is like 200 bucks, learns and writes in Spanish, and tries to figure it out. It's like, he lived there for 24 years. Unbelievable. So, yeah, and I complain about stuff. I mean, imagine going over to uh, Vietnam or something, and uh, just uh, you, while you're away, you hear, you know, you read on your Google News feed that, uh, you know, Canada has declared war on America. He was introduced to the circles of Borges, but he was fascinated by lowlife Argentina, not by the upper crust fancy circles of which Borges and Casares and Ocampo were definitely part of. Gombrowicz began writing Pornografia in 1955, after he wrote other novels which he's well known for. Pornography is a story that takes place in 1943 about a character named Witold, who is living in what was once Poland and what was once Warsaw, at the rock bottom of an accomplished fact. I think that is one of the most effective descriptions to describe a place post-war, you know, after the battle, at the rock bottom of an accomplished fact. There's so much stone-like brutality in that, implied in that statement. That's the Poland that this story takes place in. Anyways, Witold, this character, is invited to visit the countryside by this man named Hippolyte. And Witold is accompanied in this journey to the country uh, by a strange taciturn male companion named Frederick. While out there visiting, and I think the first time happens in a church, Vitold suddenly notices how Hippolyte's son, Carol, and this other girl, the same age, or around the same age, named Henia, seem to go together to form a perfect couple. They're both teenagers, maybe 16 or 17. They're teenagers. There's nothing, there's nothing particularly striking about them. They're just country teenagers. They're not together, but he notices this energy about them which seems to fit perfectly. Observation, imagination, the significance of the seemingly insignificant, the complex subtleties of human interaction, this is what the book's about. It's about these two men, these older men, who, as a strange experiment, try to get these two teenagers to fall in love, to sleep with each other. But then, due to events that occur, including a murder, this escalates, and leads to them not only trying to manipulate them to sleep with each other, but also to kill. There's a lot going on here. There's an interview with the translator, Danuta Borchardt, uh, who translated this from Polish. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. The interviewer asks, what makes Pornografia unique compared to Gombrowicz's other novels? And she responds, Pornografia focuses, perhaps more than his other three novels, on the outer limits of the imagination, on the forbidden, on the erotic fantasies of middle age, and on living them through the young, and on manipulations that influence the young to the point of crime and murder. It turns into a demented psychological struggle for the character Vitold, as he thinks he may be the only one who sees this at first, who sees this, this um, potential. For, for their connection. And he thinks he's reading in all of this. It's, it's too, you know, it's not obvious to anybody else. And he considers abandoning the idea. He tests out Frederick to see if he's paying attention as well, to see if he's attuned 
to the possibilities at hand. And he is, shockingly. But neither of them speak about it at first. And it's when Vitold is considering giving it up that he begins to find these letters to him from Frederick. These letters which are stuck in places where he knows Vitold will find them. Letters that are almost insane in their detailed description of the exact ideas that correlate with Vitold's regarding this couple and the erotic possibilities. It's like, it's, it's so specific and nuanced and strange. It's like a, it's like a, 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 a really surreal, it's, it's almost like dream logic, you know? Like, nobody could possibly be attuned to something that subjective or, or in, insignificant. It's, it's too subtle. It's n nobody, but yet several characters in this book are. It's like, so what if that was the case, basically? But they can't talk about it. But they begin to orchestrate events to allow this relationship to happen. Subtle things, including making the fiancé of Henia, the girl, Vaklov, jealous. So Vitold, back to real life for a sec, back in Argentina, had a cafe he used to go to where he had his own chess table. You know, where he'd go and play with others. That occurred to me while writing this. It's like a chess game, but with people. But who is on the opposing side, I wonder? You know, if, if, uh, if Vitold and Frederick are on this side trying to get this couple to, to come together, then who is the opposing team? Nature, fate, indifference, the grim realities of war? I don't know. Yes, there's the obvious perverted interpretation, where you could look at it as these two seedy middle-aged guys trying to get this teenage couple to bang, but that doesn't reveal the depth of it. It's like reducing Lolita to like this pedophile who's in love with this young girl and that's it. That certainly is a component of the book, but it's also a depiction of the jealousy and desire of old age for that exuberance and freshness of youth, for the realization of beauty, almost this vicarious love affair through these teenagers. And considering the circumstances, that's not an insignificant thing. It's a very, very unique idea. Because where are they? They're in the Polish countryside in the middle of World War II. The Jews have been either murdered or shipped away. Could there be a less beautiful place and time in history? What it seems to be to me is the jealousy and desire of old age for that exuberance and freshness of youth. So one possible reading is that it could be seen as the desire of revival, of human passion, in the middle of this place and time which is strikingly barren of any kind of redeeming beauty or hope. But of course, along with this, you have the cheeky and sinister disturbing interpretation of their manipulation of events and these teenagers. There's no way their behavior is justifiable. It's not even beautiful. It's just sort of like, how do you understand it? You have this couple which turns into an obsession not only for these two men, but then also for her fiancé as well, who initially, unperturbed by their relationship because they've known each other since childhood, they have like zero interest in one another, begins to see things that are just too intimate. And yet it's not even overt. That's what Gombrovich is very good at. He's describing the subtleties, I mean the r real minutia of human behavior and thought. I mean, it's incredible how, how he's able to excavate stuff that's very, 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 very deep down in there. Very difficult to articulate. I've never really seen, I, I suppose that's what makes a writer incredible, is when they're able to write, write things that people think and that are recognizable by us that we have never, ever, ever seen described before. It's not obscene. It's not or, or perverted or shocking. It's it's just like, whoa, my God, that is so ridiculously specific. How did you even do that? It's amazing. So yeah, it's not even overt. It's too small. It's the way movements happen. It's, it's vague, you know? Or the way Henia is talking to Vaklov, the fiancé, but actually talking to Carol, the teenage boy, who's in the same room. The striking thing about the book is that these three men become attuned to the subtleties that cause these two teenagers to fit together perfectly in a pure, unselfconscious manner. It's the desire of the old for youth. The desire of these creatures, these middle-aged men who have just seen too much. Maybe it's that kind of naturalism that is inherent to like the teenage years that after, you know, having layers upon sedimentary layers of thought and just anxiety and God knows what life experience with the war, it's sort of like this twisted, yes, but understandable yearning for youth, a life, a romance, a possibility, 
of not having all of that anymore, even if vicarious. It's tragic. I mean, it's strange and it's weird, but it's also sad, you know? It's the desire of the old for youth. Something that is not talked about enough in literature, I don't think. That's a big component and something that Gombrowicz meditates on in the novel. The book really makes you begin to feel the weight of added complexity that aging brings to a person. When you're young, there's a natural flow to things, a purity, and a strange innocence even in acts of cruelty committed by those who are young, as the book demonstrates. Contrary to what one may expect from the title, there's no sex, and it's not pornographic in the assumed sense. Not at all. It's a provocative title. What is obscene, it's implied, is the behavior of the men in their chess game. Its eroticism is psychological and indirect, but not in any physical way. It's kind of like Renee's flesh. Maybe even less physical, though. And I think that Piñera and Gombrowicz actually knew each other in Argentina when, when Piñera was over there before going back to Cuba. They may have been friends, but I'm not sure. But if they were friends, that would be interesting, because there's a perverseness to both of their styles. There's a similarity uh, where, where it's, it's indirect, it's, it's what's not being said. But I'm telling you, Gombrowicz can truly evoke a mood, a setting, an atmosphere. Listen to this, it's when they're in the church. The church ceased to be a church. A space had intruded, but a space that was cosmic, black. And this wasn't even happening on Earth, but rather, the Earth had transformed itself into a planet suspended in the universe. Cosmos was here. This was happening somewhere on its territory, to such a degree that the light of the candles, and even the light of day penetrating the stained glass windows became as dark as night. Thus we were no longer in church, in this village, not even on earth, but instead, and in keeping with reality, yes, in keeping with the truth, we were somewhere in the cosmos, suspended with our candles and our glitter, and somewhere in that vastness we were performing these strange things with ourselves and among ourselves, like a monkey making faces in a vacuum. It was our particular teasing, somewhere, in a galaxy, a human provocation in darkness, a performance of bizarre movements in an abyss, grimacing in boundless immensity. And our drowning in space was accompanied by a horrible intensification of the concrete nature of things. We were in the cosmos, yet we were like something terrifyingly known, defined in every detail. The bells rang for the elevation. Frederick kneeled. Man. A human provocation in darkness. A performance of bizarre movements in an abyss, grimacing in boundless immensity. This is underlined. I wonder if that was Jordan. If so, that was a great, great choice to underline. Anticlerical, definitely. Seems like a devout atheist. But particularly his descriptions of nature and nightfall and things like that. Utterly sensual and sophisticated. As if the eroticism was displaced. Infused in the natural world around the bodies instead of emanating from the bodies themselves. Rather, it's gestures, glances, small, seemingly insignificant acts that actually hold profound significance that communicate the relationship of this couple. The title, Pornografia, remains the same as the word in Polish. As back when Gombrowicz titled the book, the prevalence of pornography, of course, wasn't as pervasive. Part of it feels like Nabokov, other parts feel more like Bataille. The erotic obsession combined with the cosmic descriptions in the church plus nature and all, you know, all these elements, they sort of that it feels a lot like in the camp of Bataille. And the setting of war and atheistic philosophy reminds me a little bit of Journey to the End of the Night by uh, Céline, but less sarcastic. It's provocative, surreal. I feel like Andrzej Zielowski would have made a great adaptation, the fellow who uh, directed Possession. He was a Polish director who passed away a few years ago, and, uh, and I think Cosmos, his adaptation of Gombrowicz's novel, was his last film. And I didn't see it, but I should. Better Than Food, one worth returning to. There's a lot to unpack here. So, time for the coffee lottery. For those of you who are new, the coffee lottery is where I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video. I place their names in this mason jar, and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And if you'd like to get in on that, you can head to the description box below and click the link, or you can go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. And $1 or more will get you access to the patron-only reviews, plus the Better Than Friday newsletter, newsletter I send out every Friday, which is just five things that I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books, films, articles, music, all kinds of stuff. Changes week to week. So, thank you very much to all the patrons. Best of luck. Here we go. Eric. Thanks a bunch, Eric. Really appreciate it. You're going to get 
Pornografia, my Vitol Gombrovich, and uh, some delicious coffee. And I am thrilled to send it your way, man. From one friend to another. Please always remember to bring a book, wherever you go. Never know when you'll have five, 10, 15 minutes. Dedicate that time to reading, you'll finish more books, and voila, Bob's your uncle. So, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching, take care of yourselves, have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. Also, die reading, fuck it. Somebody stole the die reading tagline, put it on a shirt. I'm, yeah, yeah. Should have copyrighted that shit. Anyways, maybe I will. I'll sue him.